Okay. It's a great pleasure to have Ken Safa here um, again. Actually, you came two, three years ago. Three. Yeah, three. I hope the time flies um, uh, to give a very nice talk on his on his um, Afanaf project, um, which probably most of you know. It's, it's a, a very nice web-based database project, uh, starting out with, with an Afan African language, and expanding to all kinds of other topics. Um, so that's a nice thing to look at. Um, and today he's going to talk about verb stems in EGIMA, how compositional is agglutinative. Okay. Uh, is, uh, is, is Serge Sanye on, now online? <coughs> I'm getting him online right now. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I want to say hello, I've never met him, so. Uh, <laughs> okay, Serge? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now another hello. Hi. <laughs> I don't know if you can. I'm Ken Sapphire. Hi. Uh, so you'll be able to tell me when uh, I'm uh, misreporting uh, Mamadou's uh, uh, judgments, but uh, hopefully not too loud. Shut off his voice there. Uh, Wait. <laughs> Just for now. <laughs> 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 uh, I sent you the email by. Uh, I sent you the handout by email from <coughs> Lutz's email. So you, you'll have the handout. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so this is a joint work with uh, Mamadou Basseni. Uh, it's uh, based on uh, his judgments and the judgments of uh, some of his close family members. Uh, if this language is. Uh, probably not significantly different, although uh, start an interfamily squabble by saying so, uh, from uh, Jola uh, Banjal, which is, uh, 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 I think it's uh, Mamadou's cousin wrote a book about that. So, uh, <laughs> uh, but I found in, in looking through, uh, I think it's, it was his name, Alain Christian or something like that. Yeah, Alain Christian uh, Yeah. Uh, looking through his book, at least I didn't find anything that contradicted anything we said, so uh, maybe I just didn't read it carefully enough. All right, so uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, the language as uh, Mamadou refers to it, which is uh, 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 Jola Egama, or I'll just call Egama. And uh, it's an Atlantic language, for those of you who may not be familiar with it. Uh, it's uh, uh, one of the Bach languages. Uh, now, these are languages that have a rich agglutinative morphology. Uh, those of you who are Bantuists are very familiar with this, and those of you who work on uh, Atlantic languages as well, a number of them have this kind of uh, rich suffixation. Uh, and the only question always arises is how do people uh, construct meanings out of the uh, uh, various pieces that are in these uh, rich stems? And uh, if we think about what a fully harmonic language would be, as you see in one there, uh, that would be a language in which the affix y linearly closest to the stem x forms the syntactic unit xy, a morphological unit xy, that's to say, say, some phonological process might apply to it. Um, uh, and xy is compositionally interpreted, such that those two pieces are added together in the meaning before anything else is added. And then you add something else on, and you get another further compositional meaning. And that would be the dream language easily interpretable, you, uh, you completely undo the stem and know exactly how thing, the parts added up. Uh, we are rarely so blessed, and we're certainly not blessed that way in Egema. Things seem to be out of order from the point of view of a compositional interpretation, and the things that seem to uh, function as units uh, aren't obviously things that one would identify as compositional units uh, or as uh, syntactic units. Uh, and the uh, linear relations are such that certain uh, elements of the stem that one might expect uh, to be close to the root are far from it. Okay? So this is the uh, kind of problem I'm addressing. I'm not going to solve all the problems uh, of this very complex morphology, but there's a piece of it, a couple of pieces of it, that I think I have, uh, uh, Mamadou and I have made some progress in understanding, and uh, that's what I'm going to try and account for today. Um, so at the heart of our proposal, it's really uh, uh, very syntactic in the way it's put together. The heart of the proposal is that there's a piece of the stem that uh, moves and joins higher in the same stem. Okay? And so you're going to have a piece of the stem that is going to have roughly the order you might expect, and that piece is going to move to a position 
high in the stem above positions where you would expect it to be so that you'll have things at the bottom of the remaining stem that seem to be, they, they ought to be close to the root, but in fact they're far from it. And that's going to be the reason why. And then I have to justify why one would make a move like that and uh, claim I could get away with it, you know, oh, just move it, you know, why not? Uh, of course, you need evidence for that sort of thing, apparently. So uh, we were forced to come up with some. And uh, hopefully you'll find it intriguing. Okay, so that's the uh, essential uh, port, uh, part of the analysis. We'll call that the inner stem movement analysis for reasons you'll see soon. Uh, here's the, I'm still catching my breath, four flights of stairs. <laughs> the heart medication is just not, not up to it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, and for those of us who aren't you're used to it, it's even worse, right? Okay, uh, so the order of march is on, the, uh, uh, on your handout there. So uh, first I've got to give you some basic, basic facts, then I'll set up the first puzzle, which I've sort of introduced, uh, uh, having uh, uh, material distant from the stem that should be compositionally closer to it. Uh, and then uh, I'll make the inner stem movement proposal and defend it. Uh, and then I'll introduce two more puzzles, which are actually four puzzles altogether, uh, which deal with the relative positions of uh, argument markers and which is interpreted as benefactive and which is the direct object. And uh, very briefly, there's going to be four of these things or, or three of them and some of them duplicated and so on. Uh, but these things are going to be roaming around the stem, but not that much. Uh, and uh, the ordering of them determines certain sets of interpretations and precludes others. And uh, the uh, attempt there will be to explain why we get just the interpretations we do. The first attempt at uh, doing that, I'm going to present a, a pragmatic proposal about how people, speakers might do it, that is uh, very appealing, I think, and very simple. Uh, but it's also much less explanatory than uh, uh, a structural proposal, which I'll show also derives uh, important features of the actual orderings that are simply assumed uh, if you uh, take the pragmatic approach. And so ultimately the uh, uh, structural approach can be more attractive. Uh, probably we won't get to this. I could talk about some of the theoretical commitments of the analysis for those particularly interested in uh, minimalist syntax uh, or some uh, uh, reasonable analogs. Uh, and or uh, I'll try to talk about how one might try to take this approach and apply it to some other languages, in particular uh, to the Bantu languages, uh, where we have some of the same kinds of reordering uh, and some intriguing differences that, I don't know, on a stretch might be derivable from a, a slight uh, uh, editing of this approach. Uh, but that probably will be for the question period. Okay, so from some basic facts, uh, it's an SVO language. Uh, subject agreement uh, is the really the only main prefix. There's one other little prefix that we don't quite understand. It's a little N thing that uh, appears and disappears depending on whether or not we have uh, 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 irrealis interpretation. If it's irrealis, the N seems to disappear, but we don't really understand that. Otherwise, the, uh, and that's only with the uh, uh, third person, I think. Uh, maybe it shows up with some, some of the other persons. I'm not sure third person uh, singular. Uh, anyway, we'll uh, abstract away from both of the prefixes, just assume that there's always subject agreement unless there's a, uh, a, a, an infinitive. An infinitive is essentially a noun class marker uh, and uh, I'll call it the infinitive. Uh, it's in, uh, when, you, when it occurs as a complement to a verb uh, as an infinitive, uh, it's, uh, it's in complementary distribution with the subject marker. That's, uh, that's it for prefixes and uh, for the most part, I won't be talking about them further. When the uh, subject marker is present, as, as it almost always is, uh, the, uh, the subject uh, uh, does not, a full um, noun phrase subject does not have to appear, but it can. Okay. Um, there's a, a no tense except for a future uh, morpheme, which is uh, independent, and I won't have anything to say about that. Uh, so, but it is important to keep in mind that there are no tense morphemes, there are only uh, aspectual morphemes. Okay, uh, there's a lot of uh, suffixes. And so uh, I'll sort of go through them briefly here 
and then you'll see there's a summary afterwards. Um, well, uh, closest to the stem, I'll work from the, uh, uh, closest to the root rather, I'll root for the root outwards. Uh, there are three uh, affixes. There's the causative affix, which is probably not distinguishable from a, a kind of repetition affix uh, that's directly uh, attached to the root. Uh, so, uh, and also the in inherent reflexive attaches directly to the root. Uh, and since all of these attach directly to the root, only one of them could ever occur on a particular verb. Okay, they, they can't, one can't attach outside of any of the others. Uh, it's not clear that the causative and the repetitive are different because they have the same uh, phonology, so uh, it's, uh, uh, I'll just leave that open. Uh, I don't know why that particular portion of the, uh, 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 that particular affix is so close to the root. I, I don't have a story about that. But uh, uh, I have a feeling it has to do with the fact uh, that there's a close, uh, for argument relation. Uh, okay, but the causative is, uh, is uh, productive, by the way. So it's, it's, not, a, it's not like it's a, a, a highly uh, uh, lexically restricted affix. That's, that's a common affix. Uh, productive. All right, after the, uh, I call that the innermost stem, okay? So that's the root plus one of these affixes. The next uh, portion of the stem uh, could refer to, we'll refer to it as the, the inner stem. And that uh, is uh, followed then by either a reciprocal marker or a reflexive marker or both. The reciprocal marker has several other interpretations. I've called it the reciprocal marker uh, because it suits my purpose, okay? Uh, but it has uh, several other meanings and if we have some time we can maybe talk about those because they lead to uh, uh, some interesting ambiguities. Uh, only, I only got a partial handle on, on those. But uh, for now, we'll treat it uh, uniquely uh, for purposes of discussion as a marker of reciprocals. Uh, and like the reflexive marker, uh, which also has one other uh, kind of emphatic meaning, which I'll set aside also, uh, these, uh, these markers can occur, can occur in either order. Um, and uh, you could have two of each of them. All right? uh, I mean, if you had enough uh, uh, pragmatics, you could probably get, you know, more than three of these. Uh, and uh, we're going to only talk about cases where there are two and where they represent arguments, that is to say arguments of the verb, okay, uh, or benefactive arguments. Uh, and we'll come back to that. So they're the next two things, okay. They can be there or not, but if they're there, then they mark the edge of what we're calling the inner stem. After that, uh, you start to see a, a series of affixes that are strictly ordered. Uh, the first of these we call former. It's kind of a used to meaning or, or a, on a noun it would mean the former president or something like that. Um, and then uh, there's a kind of locative and uh, what uh, uh, Alain Christian I think called it uh, uh, a centrifugal uh, so it's a question of whether something is coming towards you or away from you kind of thing, where the action is coming towards you or away from you. Followed by a habitual marker, uh, and followed by something we're calling a perfective marker, but we really don't understand exactly what it is, uh, because it seems to occur in some cases where what's going on doesn't seem perfective. Okay. Uh, followed by negation. Uh, which has two allomorphs depending on what the, I think the shape of the habitual marker is, I forget. Um, and uh, there's uh, also an inclusive marker which is earlier on, I think the, the ordering is in two. Okay, you see the full order of these things. Uh, there is, uh, the inclusive marker is only uh, goes with the first person to indicate who's in the conversation kind of thing. Um, and, uh, and finally the passive. Um, <coughs> Now, there are certain uh, co-occurrence restrictions, so uh, the, uh, that so-called perfective uh, never co-occurs uh, with passive object marker or, um, or a duplication. Uh, but uh, the uh, perfective, uh, uh, the passive marker would occur after negation, which is in a position uh, where, it's in, where negation is in complementary distri distribution with the perfective. So that ordering is, is uh, uh, perfective uh, before passive is, uh, you know, sort of not, not real, okay? Because we couldn't test it. <laughs> um, and, uh, but after that, crucially, that marks the, what we're called the outer stem, okay, morphologically. 
And then after those things, you get the object markers, if there are any. Okay, so those object markers then are, uh, form the outermost stem. The outermost stem is the outermost stem because the thing that attaches to that is uh, a reduplicated stem. And that's the only place where, only thing that can occur outside of these uh, uh, markers. Okay? So uh, the way in which I've talked about these various uh, uh, units of the stem, uh, as identified by the morphology, you see uh, a kind of bracketing in three. That's not intended to be syntactic bracketing. That's just sort of how I've grouped the various morphological portions of the stem in, in, in number three there. Uh, and so you see the innermost uh, stem is the root plus the uh, 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 root attaching affix. The inner stem is that plus the reciprocal or the reflexive marker or, or iterations of those. Um, and then the next portion is, uh, is the inner stem plus the string of uh, rigidly ordered affixes out to the end of those, which is perfective or passive. Uh, and then uh, to attaching to that are the object markers, okay, forming the outermost stem. And then the RED there, that's reduplication. That's, uh, if there's a reduplicated verb uh, stem, that's where it occurs, okay? Uh, Okay, uh, all of these are then, uh, or some of these at least, are uh, exemplified in the examples in 4, okay? So you could see, for example, in 4D that the uh, part that's, uh, by the way, there's things that says pass there in 4A and 4C. <coughs> that should be perfective. That's the wrong uh, uh, affix in the gloss there. That should be perfective instead of pass. Um, the... Uh, uh, in C and D, you see reduplicated uh, versions, okay? And uh, the stuff in the gloss that's in uh, italics, that's the portion that's been reduplicated, okay? The, the gloss corresponding to that. And as you can see, it, it contains the uh, inner stem elements, okay? Um, all right. So... Uh, one of the things we're going to have to talk about uh, uh, are the uh, um, inner, uh, sorry, the, the uh, uh, benefactive or uh, indirect object and the direct object and where they actually are an argument structure. Uh, and uh, I'll come back to that. But essentially, you get the summary now. Uh, so, innermost stem, uh, you see the uh, uh, exemplification in seven. The inner stem, you get the exemplification in uh, eight. Uh, and A and B, uh, the outer stem uh, following that, then the outermost stem. So uh, I'm skipping ahead now to when we get to the first stem puzzle, okay, if you're looking on your handout. Uh, so you have generally the picture now, I think, uh, of uh, how rich the stem is, how there seem to be different regions of it, how they seem to fit together one inside the other, like a Chinese box. and. Uh, uh, we're left with this, uh, fuzz with this question of why is it that the stuff, uh, uh, things like uh, passive, uh, are very uh, far from the root, okay? Uh, and, uh, and moreover, between the, uh, the root and passive out here, you get all of these uh, things that are sort of aspectual, like former and uh, habitual, okay? Uh, and so the puzzle comes in, if you look, think about it, uh, Cinque has talked about uh, the kind of uh, clausal structure of uh, adverbs, and uh, one of the things that he points out, ah. Clip for this? Ah. Okay. It goes where? Can you hear me? Yeah? Okay? All right.
<laughs> right, let's start with that one then. Yes, dramatic difference. Um, <laughs> I think, tell me if you can see that just well enough. Okay. Uh, the essential idea is that there are, um, there is a hierarchy of adverbial modification and a spectral modification, modal, and so forth. Uh, and somewhere down here, we get to the, you know, uh, verb argument structure argument. As I always tell my students, this doesn't actually correspond to writing. Uh, it's a mnemonic for something I've just said. Moments later, it sort of disappears because it's ir ir illegible, okay? Uh, <laughs> so that says verb argument structure. That's when I point to that, it's sort of like establishing a point for the sign language, you know. Uh, that's verb argument structure, okay? So that, that's uh, 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 presumably somewhere lower in the tree than things like, uh, you know, various aspectual nodes. Or perhaps uh, adverbial nodes. Okay. It depends on the adverb. Okay. Some of them are very close to the verb argument structure and some are not. Uh, repetition might be one of those that's very close. Uh, whereas uh, we talk about things like habitual, that's probably somewhere up in here. Okay. Uh, or used to, it's probably somewhere, somewhere higher in the tree than you would think of things like, you know, I take a subject or I take a direct object. That stuff is going to be lower. Okay. Uh, and also something you might expect to be lower, something maybe passive like, would be down here, right? And then you'd have something, some lower verb-like structures. Let's call them verb question mark, okay? Uh, and this would uh, affect those arguments by, say, uh, subtracting, say, uh, uh, the external argument or somehow uh, putting it in chômage or wherever you think of it. Uh, and yet what we seem to get is this portion acts like it's over here when this is uh, FMR, okay, used to, okay? This acts like it's here rather than there. So I'm going to say, suppose it starts here and moves here. Well, if it starts here, then we get the kind of compositional interpretation that we want, right? And so now the only question is, all right, where do I get off saying that that thing moves here? Okay, here's how I get off saying that, okay. Uh, if you look at the uh, diagram in nine, okay, you see uh, essentially what I've done here, okay, uh, with a little bit more and a little bit less, okay. There's, uh, so you've got the subject up at the top in the agreement uh, domain, okay, uh, which I'm assuming is outside of this whole uh, uh, even the outermost stem, which I think I you think of the agreement as attaching, prefixing to all of that. Um, and so what seems to be the case here is that stuff that's down at the bottom there, the inner stem, I'm claiming that that moves up to some place somewhere between that uh, uh, subject marker and former. Okay, that's where it would attach. And then you'd see all the stuff uh, former after that. I don't know why that happens. Okay, I'm not going to claim I understand that. Suppose we say that it happens. Okay, then we're going to get the right ordering linearly and we'll have the underlying compositional structure that we want. So why can we say this? Well, notice that what, to do this, we'd be doing something like 11. Okay, we leave some b behind some trace of uh, having been there and move all that stuff attaching to what I've called the outer stem, okay? So what about that little T there? Well, in minimalist theorizing, all movement leaves a copy, okay? And then uh, the phonology sorts out which copy is pronounced, and it's almost always the highest one, except in certain kinds of situations, which hopefully there's a good theory for. And then uh, another uh, thing that this modeling is used for is reduplication. Well, what do you know? We have reduplication in exactly that spot, right? When reduplication occurs, that's where it goes. So the idea is that when this movement takes place, it leaves a copy below, which normally isn't pronounced. In situations where you want to avoid um, uh, uh, historical present, or you want to say something, somebody really did this, okay? It's kind of a, an emphasis. That's when you use this reduplication, those two situations, so, so I'm told. Uh, and in those situations, the lower 
uh, portion of the stem is also pronounced. So in a sense, reduplication is exactly modeled by the movement. It's exactly what you expect from this way of thinking about movement. And so that's my uh, main justification for saying uh, not only does this solve our problem with respect to this hierarchy and getting the right compositional interpretation, it also solves a morphological problem in explaining exactly why the uh, pronunciation of the reduplication is at this lowermost point. All right? The only thing I haven't, uh, well, one of the things I haven't addressed is the position of the object markers, and I'm coming back to that. Okay. So, uh, that's uh, uh, the essential of the analysis, okay? Uh, and uh, it's hard to see how another approach would unite these two kinds of things. The, uh, the position of the stem, the uh, compositional interpre interpretation, so getting linear, linear order, those two things together, and also deriving, just as a consequence, where the reduplication would have to occur. Because that is a consequence of this analysis, it's not an artifact of it, okay? Uh, okay, um, so that resolves the first puzzle we wanted to address. Why are the affixes out of order? At least that portion of the affixes, why are they out of order? But now we have to approach these uh, puzzles for interpretation. And uh, let me explain how they, they line up. Uh, well, we have uh, uh, multiple uh, uh, reflexive markers or multiple reciprocal markers or combinations of the two, okay? Uh, this is a language, I should say first, uh, where there is no applicative affix. So if you have, uh, uh, say, an intransitive verb uh, and uh, there's another argument after it, uh, it's interpreted as benefactive uh, if, you're, if the uh, pragmatics allows for it. Okay? Uh, so you can get something like John died for Bill. Okay? And it, but the way it would come out is John died and then it would be Bill. And the only way you'd make sense of it is to say, well, you must have done it for Bill. <coughs> Bill's benefit, something, okay? Uh, so uh, we don't see an applicative affix. A lot of the other languages in this region have applicative affixes. Uh, and so I'm going to take that as a sort of an accident and assume that there's actually one there that just doesn't have any morphology. And uh, that does a little bit of work for me, but I think you could probably uh, do this another way. Uh, as long as we have the same argument structure consequence that I'm going to be assuming. All right, uh, so that's how you could get a number of these things, even for verbs that are intransitive. Um, and uh, for transitive verbs, of course, you're going to get two. And if you've had, actually, there's cases where you can get three and even four, depending on how uh, creative you are. But I haven't analyzed uh, uh, triples and quadruples uh, for that effect because I don't know all of the, uh, you know, the, the thing is working with, with Mamadou, uh, when almost, for most of these, these uh, stems that we, we managed to come up with, uh, you said, oh yeah, you could do that, but it would mean this, you know? And so there's a remar remarkable range of ambiguity in many of these structures. So when something actually isn't ambiguous, it stands out. Uh, in any case, uh, let's take a, case, a look at a case where something isn't ambiguous, and that's uh, in uh, 13a and b. When the order of the, uh, uh, reflexive followed by the reciprocal in 13a, that only has one interpretation. They praise each other for themselves. Okay. Now notice that the uh, for themselves, that's the benefactive, it comes first. Okay. And the reciprocal comes second. This has other interpretations because the reciprocal marker has other interpretations that don't correspond to uh, arguments. Okay. Uh, so it can mean continual, it can mean simultaneously, and it can mean together. And I, uh, I'm not addressing those meanings. And uh, ultimately, we're going to have to address those meanings, but I'm not doing it today. Okay? Um, so, uh, because it has to do with why it's in the inner stem, that's why I'll have to care about it. Uh, all right, so uh, the each other there in the uh, uh, 13a has to be uh, the direct object, not the benefactive and uh, the reverse in, uh, in 13b. So the order of these things matters. You can get either order, but once you have the order, the meaning is fixed. Okay? Uh, by contrast, when you look at 14, okay, uh, that's a combination where you see um, a reflexive or a reciprocal in combination with an object marker. 
Now, uh, according to the ordering I've given you, that's always going to be the case, that the uh, uh, reflexive reciprocal will have to come before the object marker. That's a fixed order, right? Uh, and so, because one of them belongs to, attaches to the outermost stem and the other one's in the inner stem, you're never going to have the opposite order. Uh, and, but when you have that situation, it's ambiguous, right? You could get either reading. So they praised uh, themselves for uh, him or her, or they praised <coughs> him or her for themselves, and uh, likewise. So, um, so in those cases, it's uh, ambiguous, okay? Now, uh, another situation that can arise is where you have two object markers. Now, if the two object markers are uh, of exactly the same ranking on the person animacy hierarchy, such that you can't choose between them, okay, on that hierarchy, then their order is optional, okay? But the first one, when they're optional, is always the indirect object, and the second one is always the direct object. If, however, the uh, person animacy hierarchy intervenes, and that is uh, listed in 15, okay, uh, then it's always ambiguous, because that's a fixed order, okay? That means that, uh, so the, uh, an object marker that's human must always precede one that's non-human, uh, first person must always, or first or second person must always proceed third person, uh, animates before inanimates, and when all those things are set aside, then uh, say uh, third person uh, plurals uh, will proceed uh, third person singulars. Okay? Uh, so you have all of those ordering things, and those are fixed. But if you manage to get two object markers that are uh, uh, a tie on the scale, then their order is optional, but their interpretation is fixed. When their, interpretation, uh, when their order is fixed, their interpretation is optional. Okay? So that looks like a very uh, uh, simple uh, uh, way to sort of pull these apart. Okay? Uh, and so I'll just skip ahead uh, to the generalization in 18. So fixed ordering relations between Argument representing affixes A and B typically allow for ambiguous interpretations of underlying semantic role composition. Uh, but if surface ordering uh, of A and B is optional, then surface AB requires uh, uh, A higher than B, uh, and surface BA requires B higher than A. Now I'm assuming that uh, indirect object and, uh, uh, and benefactives are higher in the argument structure than direct objects. And this goes along with a whole line of thinking that uh, has been done on applicatives uh, and especially in uh, 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 generative grammar, but uh, not uniquely there. Um, so uh, one might, uh, now here's my straw man, and, but it's, it's a pretty tough straw man. I mean, it's just like, you know, you might look at this and say, yeah, that's the story, you know, uh, and that's in uh, 19, okay? Uh, the optional order has rigid interpretation because the speaker's choice can signal the intended interpretation. But when the order is rigid, the intended interpretation cannot be distinguished by morpheme order, so the listener must continue to entertain two possible interpretations that the speaker may have intended, and usually in a uh, pragmatic situation, you're going to know which one was intended. Okay? So if you know what orders are fixed and what are not fixed, then presumably you can do this kind of uh, reasoning, and you will get the right result every time, okay? as far as I can tell. All right, so that looks pretty appealing. I mean, you know, why not stop there? Uh, well, the reason I don't stop there is because it doesn't explain why the orders are fixed or why the particular orders are the ones that they are. And one would like to have an explanation that did that and got this result, okay? And that's what I'm gonna try and do next. And so, uh, essentially, in the structural account, the way you get ambiguity is that you have two underlying structures but only one surface order. I mean, that's very, it goes right back to the very beginning of general grammar in the 1950s, okay? Uh, that's, and I'm, I'm uh, uh, applying that kind of a uh, strategy uh, to explain which cases are ambiguous and which ones are not. The ones that are not ambiguous are where there's only one underlying structure that could co correspond to the overt uh, uh, morpheme order, okay? And it'll, I'll show that the pragmatic strategy, appealing as it is, is less explanatory than the structural approach when all is said and done in part because the structural approach already relies on the inner stem movement, uh, which we've already seen has done some of the work for us that we might otherwise not have anticipated, but not only for that reason. Okay, so I am assuming uh, something about uh, the argument structure of applicatives that's very important, uh, or at least uh, 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 the relationship between um, 
benefactives and direct objects, and you see that in 20, okay? Uh, where uh, I'm assuming that there's some kind of applicative head, it's higher than some kind of verb root head, okay? Uh, and that to form a normal verb, what happens is, especially if there's a, benef a benefactive argument, is the verb root raises to the applicative node, joins to it, and then that together raised to the little v node, which identifies the root as verbal, okay? Uh, and that's your typical verb root, okay? Uh, that means, however, from the structure you see in 20, that the benefactive argument is higher in structure than the direct object, and this is going to be crucial, okay? That's the part that I need out of the applicative being present there. Uh, so even if you assume that there's no applicative marker, uh, uh, in, unless you uh, I can recapitulate this much of the structure, okay, in terms of what C commands what, uh, uh, that's what I need crucially to do what I'm, what I'm going through here. Uh, however, uh, the way I'm doing it of V adjoining, big V adjoining to applicative adjoining together to little v is crucial for certain assumptions in minimalist uh, movement theories, okay, uh, and. Uh, if you're interested in those details, uh, then it has to be done that way, and it has an interesting consequence if it's done that way. All right, so uh, now I'm going to make some other uh, assumptions, and some of these uh, might seem uh, unobjectionable or even elegant, and others might seem to you, if you're not uh, familiar with minimalist theorizing, they might seem to you exotic. So uh, hopefully if they uh, get too exotic, you'll stop me and say, that's ridiculous, and I'll say, you're wrong, and then we'll continue. Um, okay, so uh, in 21, so I'm going to assume that the, uh, the object markers, the reciprocal marker, reflexive marker, they're all argument suffixes. Again, again with the proviso that the reciprocal marker has some other meanings, okay, and I'm, which I'm ignoring. Uh, and that means uh, that since they're suffixes, it means that in the phonology they're going to be right adjacent to some verb stem. I mean, that just has to do with the morphological requirement they have. Uh, but uh, by saying we're, they're argument suffixes, that means they originate in an argument position. I've given you the argument structure, so if a, a particular uh, object marker or reflexive marker uh, is going to represent uh, a, a benefactive argument, then it has to originate in 20 in where it says ben. Okay? Uh, and it will be in complementary distribution with a full uh, uh, DP in that position. Okay? So if you get a full DP, then you don't get these markers and vice versa. So a full DP would be like, you know, John or the, the, the man. If you get that there, then you can't use an object marker from, uh, as far as I can tell. Uh, all right. Uh, now here's where I start uh, uh, getting more particular in my assumptions. The, uh, I'm assuming that the object markers attach to a phrase. The phrase they attach to is something, this edge, okay? Right, this, this, this phrasal thing that just above the argument structure, essentially. The way that I'm cashing that out in this particular theory is that the, the phrase projected by the little vp. The little v is the thing that tells you you have a transitive structure, okay, especially if there is a, a, the, uh, the subject argument, if you want to call it that. We, I, it says ea here, that means external argument. That is introduced in the specifier position of little v for all transitive verbs, okay. Uh, within this theory. Uh, and so the little VP contains the argument structure of the whole uh, uh, unit there. And my claim is that the object markers, this is where they, they land, right here. Okay? And they attach to phrased. That makes them different from the reflexive marker and the reciprocal marker, which are otherwise the same, except they attach actually to uh, the V0, little v. They attach to uh, a morphological unit, and that's the difference between them and the object markers, okay? And hopefully that'll get us all the consequences we need for their distribution. Uh, so, uh, in D there, you see what we have, uh, uh, how, how a uh, complex verb would be formed as I described it, you know, first the uh, uh, the, the big V would adjoin to the applicative, uh, and then the applicative, uh, the V applicative would adjoin to the little V to make a complex V. And it's to those things that the indirect object uh, and direct object um, reflexives and reciprocals would be adjoining to. 
Uh, and so uh, they have a different landing site in the structure than the object markers. That's going to be crucial because the object markers are going to escape this thing and that's how they're going to be stranded at the end. Okay? Because what's going to happen when we move the inner stem, the inner stem is going to be that complex V with the reciprocal and, and reflexive markers on it. So when that, little, that V moves, okay, it's going to strand everything else, but what's left? Everything's moved out. Well, all that's left is going to be the object markers, okay? if, there, if there are any there. Okay? Okay, so if you turn the turn the page. I don't know if you're turning the page. It's 23. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm out of sequence for you because I have a little more stuff on my page. Uh, so uh, in 23, you see what happens if the uh, uh, direct object and the indirect object happen to be object markers. Now, if they're not object markers, and you're simply going to see uh, in those positions first the indirect object and then the direct object. That is the unmarked order. Uh, for uh, uh, benefactive and uh, direct object is uh, uh, benefactive first, the other one second. Uh, so what will happen then is that these two things will adjoin to VP. Now here's the crucial part uh, where I, I, apply, I appeal to uh, some minimalist technology. Okay? Both of them are heading the same place. How do we predict what order they end up in when they both move to the left? Remember the order is crucial, right? Because uh, if they're equally ranked, the higher one better be the indirect object. So how does this work? Well, there's a theory uh, um, was put forward by Norvin Richards of MIT uh, uh, some time ago, uh, and it's uh, one of a, uh, a set of uh, proposals that uh, are called shape preservation. When you move more than one thing, okay, there are structures where they move, so to speak, in tandem. They always seem to end up in the same order after they've both moved. You know, they don't change orders, okay? And uh, these affixes, I'm arguing, uh, uh, are like that. And so uh, I'm taking one of the theories that makes this prediction, and I'm applying it here in a way that is typical of it, and uh, it turns out to get the right result and, uh, and, and, and one more besides. Okay, so the way this theory works, shortest move, is the uh, uh, economy principle on movement. And what it says is when two things are going to the same place, you, use the, you make the shortest move you can make first, and then you make the next move is the next shortest move you can make. Well, the shortest move to the adjunction to the VP would be from the uh, indirect object, because that's higher in the tree. Okay, so that's going to go in a join first. But notice I've got the direct object marker underneath it. How does that happen? Well, the next move, of course, is to move the uh, direct object, but if it only has to get to the edge of the VP, it doesn't have to go outside of the higher one. It only has to go as far as the other one. Now, uh, in the adjunction theory that's typical of this theorizing, those positions are equidistant from each other. Okay? Uh, and so, uh, uh, but they're not equidistant from the launch point. Okay? From the launch point, the, the closest place you can move to and get out of little VP is to tuck in under the indirect object. And this has been uh, employed, uh, it's mostly used to account for superiority effects in, uh, uh, in Slavic languages, for example, where you have uh, multiple WH phrases moving to the front, uh, and uh, the ordering of these phrases uh, is, uh, uh, is fixed in certain ways the higher one that's moved has to end up leftmost, and then the next one has to be the one after that, and they, they can't get the other order, okay? Uh, so those are languages in which you have multiple WH movement. They're all going to the same place, just like this. <coughs> the ordering is preserved. The underlying uh, uh, sequence is preserved. That's exactly what's happening here. So I'm applying it to this exactly the same kind of case with the same kind of reasoning uh, as in the superior, superiority literature. Okay, so that means that the natural order will be when you extract two direct objects that first there will be the uh, IO and then the DO. Now remember, uh, looking at 23, when this hits the phonology, the thing that that indirect object will be next to will be a verb, right? Because the, the verb stem is going to go all the way down to here, and then uh, when the phonology comes along, these guys are going to be sitting here, and they will attach to the verb stem because they are suffixes, right? That's what we said about them as morphology. And moreover, the top one will go first, right? Simply because it's closer, and then the other one. So although the, I've, I've set them up so that they both leftward adjoin here, 
it, the actual order there doesn't matter. All that matters is one's higher in structure than the other, and the first one would count as the first suffix attached, the second one will be the second suffix attached. Okay, so we now have the fixed order of IO, IO, uh, sorry, of uh, two OMs, OMs, object markers, when they are um, uh, of the same rank, okay? Now, when this happens, since we've preserved the argument structure order, that means the interpretation will be fixed. There's only one interpretation here. The higher one has to be the in indirect object, okay? So that gets us why uh, the higher one will be the indirect object and the uh, uh, lower one will be the direct object. Now, if the uh, animacy hierarchy intervenes, it's going to mess this up, right? It's going to reorder these affixes. Now, there's two ways to approach that. One is to simply say, well, there's a morphological fact and you, you know, reorder the affixes according to the hierarchy. And that'll work for my theory, right? Uh, there's another theory that says that that also is a structural effect. And uh, Mark Baker and I have written about that, uh, actually looking at uh, uh, Bantu double object uh, constructions. Uh, in a, a Wookful paper of two years ago. Uh, and uh, I, that, that I think that theory will work here, but requires more work than I'm prepared to do today. And I'm not sure it's right. So uh, let's just stick with uh, what we can say uh, harmlessly, and nobody has a better theory of those things. Uh, and so uh, whatever the, uh, uh, the uh, hierarchy is that leads to fixed orders, that's going to disguise this structure. If it disguises this structure, that means we have two potential underlying structures, therefore ambiguity. Okay? So we get the ambiguity in the case of two object markers. Now let's go to the case of the uh, reflexive, reflexive and reciprocal markers. Okay? When the reflexive and reciprocal markers move to attach to the complex V, remember they're, they're attaching to a morphological unit, they're not attaching to a phrase. Okay? Uh, so you see in 25 what will happen there. Okay, uh, looks like I didn't get it all on one page. At least, in, well, maybe you have it all on one page. Uh, you do, okay, yeah. I was more careful with what you were reading than what I'm reading. Um, so you see the complex verb there, it has the reflexive marker and the reciprocal marker, okay? That's where they have to attach by hypothesis, okay? Now the only question is, how do we ensure the order IODO, right? Because remember, this is fixed, right? You can get either one can move uh, uh, first, uh, or sorry, either one can be uh, inner, uh, uh, closest to the verb, but the one that's closest to the verb is always the indirect object, okay? Now, if you look structurally here, structurally, this is reversed from the case we saw earlier, right? You're looking at that complex V, the highest thing in it is the direct object, uh, and the lower you know, thing under it is the indirect object. So why does this come out differently? I just had this nice story about shortest movement. But notice in the shortest move play, uh, 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 diagram, if you're comparing 23 and 25 now, those uh, adjunctions of the object marker were to phrases, and therefore one of the, the phrases, it, it C commands everything. The one that tucks under it, tucks under its C command domain. Okay. Now, in the case of uh, uh, a junction to uh, the V, the first one adjoins to the V, and by uh, uh, the shortest move, that's going to be the indirect object. Right? Now, notice though, for the direct object, it's not shorter to go and tuck in under the indirect object here. That's not a shorter move, right? Because it's not uh, the same kind of hierarchical structure you have in 23. The shorter move is to attach above, okay? And in fact, there's another principle which I won't introduce here that I've argued for in a 2010 paper in uh, biolinguistics that uh, would in fact rule out that kind of tucking in here, okay? It will rule in the other one and rule this one. It actually exactly did this long before I ever thought about these cases. Uh, so uh, what will have to turn out to be the structure is the uh, DO is higher than the IO. Well, now again, you hit the phonology. The IO is closer to the verb, it'll attach first. The DO is further from the verb, it'll attach second. The IO had to have come from the indirect object position because it was attached first by shortest move, and so it's predicted that the order should be IO, DO, and unambiguous, okay? And so uh, the optional orders, where either one of these uh, uh, elements could go 
uh, uh, reflexive, reciprocal, reciprocal, reflexive, um, their actual structural representation is, is always the same, okay? And so there's only one structure, there's only one interpretation, okay? There's only one more thing left to explain, because uh, now we have the two optional orders lead to fixed interpretations because you can read them off the structure, okay? The uh, case where uh, the object markers are obscured by the uh, hier uh, animacy hierarchy uh, gives you two underlying potential structures which you can't tell from the morphology, so this ambiguity. And now we have the case where you have one reciprocal marker or reflexive marker and one object marker. That was another instance where we had fixed order, okay, because one is in the outer stem and one's in the inner stem, and the result was ambiguity. Okay, so why should it come out ambigu ambiguous? Uh, well, you see in, uh, I think I have 25 more than once, don't I? Okay. Well, in the second 25 and 26, okay, you see these two structures. And I'm going to stop shortly after this because we're running low on time. Um, essentially, what's happened here is that first you've done the uh, uh, affixation of the, uh, of the RCM, uh, reciprocal marker, uh, to the complex verb. Okay, uh, and then you've done the extraction of the uh, object marker to uh, adjoin to the little VP. Okay, uh, subsequently you will have inner stem movement, which will take that that uh, uh, complex V and move it higher in structure. Okay, stranding the direct object at the end, and so you'll have the order, verb stem, uh, reciprocal marker, other stuff, object marker. Okay, and if you get re reduplication, you'll see the inner stem again after that. Um, those are ambiguous. Why should they be ambiguous? Well, if you look at 25 and 26, second 25 and 26, uh, what you get is the same surface order for both cases, although the structural orders, the uh, structural representations are different. Okay. So in the first one, uh, we took the indirect object and adjoined it to the verb. Remember, since uh, the direct object and the indirect object are going to different places, shortest move does not apply to them. That only distinguishes, uh, you do the shorter move if they're both going to the same place. These are going to different places, and so you don't have that. Um, so the indirect object, if it attaches to the complex V, is not slow. The direct object will uh, attach high. Remember, there's no morphological difference between the object markers when they represent benefactive or direct object uh, uh, arguments. The direct object will come out last. The reciprocal marker will come out close to the uh, uh, verb uh, root. In the opposite case, you have an object marker taken from the indirect object position and adjoined to the big, uh, to the little VP. And the reciprocal marker is adjoined to the verb. When this plays out in the uh, phonology, the reciprocal marker, you get, the, again, the same order. You'll get verb, reciprocal marker, object marker, okay? But the underlying structure will be different, and that's why you get ambiguity every time. So, uh, I could go a little further here. There's an interesting kind of climbing structure in Agama, where if you have uh, infinitive complement, all of this stuff plays out on the, uh, on the higher verb, okay? You can either leave the stuff downstairs or you can move it all up to the higher verb. If you move it up to the higher verb, all the same interpretive properties hold. All you have to assume is that instead of targeting the lower verb, the RCM and the RFM simply target the higher one, and that the uh, OMs target the higher little VP. And then when that thing reduplicates, it strands the lower uh, uh, infinitive, as you would expect, because it's only pronouncing, uh, uh, repeating the verb uh, of the higher verb, not repeating the lower verb. Or you could have reduplication of the lower verb, in which case you would say it has the same form that it normally would if it was not embedded. Okay. Uh, okay, so all that works uh, just as it should. Uh, so the conclusion for Egema is this. Uh, we could have been happy with the uh, uh, pragmatic story and said how, you know, how, you, how speakers uh, uh, on the fly interpret you know, what these things could mean. And that may even be how they do it on the fly, I don't know. Uh, but there, uh, there is a structural theory that not only explains why there are the ambiguities that there are and why the fixed orders uh, result 
uh, in those ambiguities and why the uh, uh, optional orders result in fixed interpretations. We can explain that in structural terms, plus explain why it is that object markers are stranded at the end, why it is that these uh, uh, reciprocal and reflexive markers travel with the inner stem, uh, and solve the uh, uh, compositional problem for the interpretation, okay? Uh, and why there are the sets of ambiguities that there are, it's all structural, okay? Uh, and uh, the pragmatic account simply makes no, no uh, commitment to how the orders come about, right? Doesn't explain that. This theory does. All right, so um, I think I'll stop there and I'll take questions and then maybe we can talk about a few other things if there's time. Thank you very much indeed. I'm sure there's many, many points and issues being raised by that. Um, floor is open for questions or comments? I've explained everything. There's just, just, <laughs> just no way to raise an objection. Uh. Um, thank you. Um, for this talk, I I'm still digesting, so my brain's playing <laughs> 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 traffic. Um, you raised yourself the question of how people do it on the fly, and I think for me that's the most important question, because in we know from research on Bach languages and certain Guinean languages that there's a huge amount of argument ellipses, which in this case means object ellipses. So no marker. Ah, uh, yes. Um, and um, so all your data look and you, you mentioned that pretty much elicited. Um, yeah. So th these examples you are very unlikely <coughs> to get on the fly in any of the languages in the area that I'm familiar with. So what does that mean for your account? Well, I'm not sure exactly what it is you're, you're claiming. You're claiming that these are not things people say? No, these are things that people can say in particular context or in the absence of a particular context, uh, most likely in the absence of a particular discourse context. But no, sometimes we had to create a context in yeah. order to see whether something was possible, and, and, mm -hmm. and in other cases we created a context and it simply wasn't possible. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm, I'm just wondering how your account would deal with, with um, object ellipsis, which increases the ambiguity considerably. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I don't... It's something we're struggling, so that, you know... Uh, so far as I know... But is that object empty ellipsis or ellipsis of these little markers? That's what I'm trying to... I, both. Okay. One or both? If both are missing, okay, uh, that simply isn't, uh, except for a few verbs, isn't what I know from Megama, okay? Uh, so, uh, you might also note that this is a language that doesn't have the applicative morpheme. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, there are other hints that you might get if you have an applicative morpheme and you're missing those arguments that you might be able uh, to recover, okay? Uh, which you can't in this language. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, fully elided uh, noun phrases for transitive verbs don't seem to be possible. I mean, with no object marker, no direct object. Uh, and maybe Serge can tell me that, uh, oh, there's lots of those. Uh, but uh, I, I tested for those, and we don't seem to allow yeah. Well, we have been in personal communication with Serge, Sanya, and with Alain Christian Bassel, who told us exactly that. So, but, uh, let's oh, okay. Well, that's not what I am. All right. So if there, if there is ellipsis, yes. okay. Uh, then I have to, to figure out what it would mean for the particular yeah. theory. I mean, I would presume that you would have uh, the same uh, uh, structural underlying relations, okay? Uh, and so uh, if, if an object marker was suppressed, say, okay, then in those situations where uh, the surface order ought to have given us uh, um, a strict reading, a strict uh, non-ambiguous interpretation, then an ambiguous interpretation should result. Mm -hmm. That's what I would predict. Uh, and uh, if, you know, if that's frequent, then there's a lot of those cases it's going to be ambiguous and you're going to need the uh, uh, pragmatics to figure it out. But structurally it doesn't challenge the account so far as I can see because uh, what really matters is in those cases where you see these things, there are certain things you can't do. 
okay? And we have a, stru a structural account for that, right? Uh, so uh, simply uh, saying, well, the pragmatics will help you figure it out, it doesn't, doesn't do the job there, right? It's the case, it's the things that you're not allowed to do because the <coughs> syntax doesn't let you. Uh, that is what I'm accounting for. But, you know, I, I think your straw man is, is a, it's not a good straw man because, mm. because I don't think it's a pragmatic story. I mean, no. pragmatics is maybe here or there, but what is interesting, I think, in your, in your, in, in your pragmatic account is that really it's a morphological account. Mm. What, is, what is crucial about is that you are saying, well, there is no syntax, there is no structure. It, I mean, that, you know, that's the, just... In the straw man account, yeah. Um, it's, it, you know, but some, some, somewhere, somehow you have to state which orders are fixed and which are free. Yeah. And that statement seems, that sounds like a morphological statement, not a pragmatic statement. The pragmatics then, you have to, you have to assume that morphology, morphology tells you that the pragmatics runs over it. Oh yeah, I'm assuming that. I mean, assuming that, that, that you know, the, the, the pragmatic story, right, uh, I mean, uh, objects of morphology are not objects of pragmatic theory, so far as I understand it. Uh, st pragmatic theories about strategies and uh, discourse uh, uh, reference and so on. Uh, and so you, you wouldn't refer to, refer to a piece of morphology as a, 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 an aspect of a discourse theory. It's rather uh, uh, something in a morphology that the uh, pragmatics can exploit or not. And yes. so I'm assuming that, uh, that any pragmatic theory simply assumes that there's some ordering story that goes on in the morphology, but uh, wherever there's a, a more than one uh, possible outcome, the, uh, the pragmatic story says, oh, then it's ambiguous, okay? That's all I'm, I was claiming about that theory. And it seems to me that uh, a proper pragmatic theory shouldn't uh, go any more deeply into the actual morphology uh, because they are, it's apples and oranges, right? Uh, so uh, the the, the uh, way that I'm presenting this, I mean, uh, uh, again, as I said, uh, one could always appeal to the pragmatic theory and say, well, that's how people actually uh, uh, do it on in a given situation when they're not sure. Uh, they don't compute all this other stuff and they just do that. Well, maybe that's true, but we don't know that they don't compute all this stuff. And I wouldn't uh, uh, I wouldn't undersell what the human mind can do in these uh, environments uh, because we don't know. Right? But it, see, it looks to me, it looks like you know, it's, it's a good environment for lexicalization. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think in a sense, this is a situation where you maybe can have your cake and cake and eat it. I said, you know, it looks like there's structure going on. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I mean, yeah. there's details which I don't have. In principle, I think you have to be right. Yes, yeah. you want to structure account, but still, there may well be a case for saying that an actual speech context. What people do is they just lexicalize these chunks and go for best guesses. Uh, well, that's why we chose uh, particularly uh, bizarre cases sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so that uh, so people then wouldn't be accessing you know things that they you know normally you know they have to put it together, mm -hmm. okay? And the question is, could they put it together, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and when they couldn't put it together, uh, I mean, because uh, uh, you know, Mamadou says he had lots of long conversations on the phone with his uncles and saying, well, but suppose uncle that you could do you know this was the situation. And he says, oh yeah, then you could get that, but then it would have to mean this and. Uh, and uh, you know, we went through uh, uh, several years now of uh, uh, figuring out what his uncles are thinking. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, the the point is that you know uh, what I described as the pragmatic account needs a place to start, right? And it, 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 the, uh, this theory tells you that you know the place to start is also uh, tells you a lot about the, where you finish. Right, uh, and that you probably don't need the pragmatics to do quite so much work. That a lot of it's being done by the structural relations. Now, in terms of lexicalization, I do think there are uh, aspects of le lexicalization that uh, I have to appeal to. For example, uh, I don't understand why the causative is in the intersem, right? Uh, and that is something that seems to be very much driven by uh, some kind of. Uh, uh, deep and evil morphology that says, you know, uh, causative theft. It makes sense that it would be down in this sector with the rest of the uh, argument structure since causative does that, right? Uh, so things that add, oh, there we go again. Fishing. There we go. Got one. Um, things that add structure would presumably be down there, so cause might be down there. Uh, but I don't feel that that's that confident with that. Uh, especially, 
See, a lot of the languages where you see that kind of thing, where something you wouldn't expect to be quite so low, it's usually, uh, uh, like in the, in the Bantu languages, you get these affixes that are not frequently used, or you know, they, you know, they're not productive, and they might occur closer to the stem. I think uh, Jeff Good has talked about some of these kinds of cases, uh, and, and Larry Hyman. Uh, but cause is not one of those. I mean, not this cause. I mean, if you're talking about the, 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 the short causative of Bantu, now, that's something else, right? Uh, but that would notice, all right, now here's, here's the Bantu story, if it ever gets off the ground, and I don't, I don't know if it'll ever get off the ground, but here, here's, the, here's what could happen. Uh, passive in Bantu, uh, you know, this is famous carp thing that Larry talked about, right? uh, Larry Hyman, uh, namely that there, uh, there's a tendency in Bantu for the affixes of the verb, uh, the extensions to line up causative, applicative, reciprocal, passive, okay? And that there are occasional uh, 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 blips in the direction, usually, of getting a more compositional interpretation, okay? And he, he put these as a kind of opposition, right? Uh, whether uh, trying to put it in uh, an optimality theory terms where uh, you might rate the uh, um, template higher in some languages and the composition higher in others. He called it mirror. Uh, and, uh, and those competitions would produce variation, okay? But that required assuming that there was something deep about this that doesn't seem conceptually necessary in any sense. I mean, uh, why should this be attractive in, in some, you know, conceptual sense such that Bantu languages would want to have it, okay? You say, okay, well, there's a historical, you know, tendency. But that's, you know, but a lot of languages don't, you know, seem to get past it for certain kinds of constructions. Why should it be there? Uh, but if you notice this piece, okay, that's CA, causative applicative. That's also part of my inner stem, okay? And passive is out here on the end, as it is here, okay? It's just possible that some version of an inner stem movement could be moving these things, actually, sorry, wrong, right, from there, from somewhere lower in the stem to this position. Now, in the best case, there would be some reduplication kind of evidence, and I haven't found any, okay? Uh, but maybe people who know a lot more about this can think of... Causative, not, not but causative one. Yeah. The causative reduplicates well, yeah. 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 See, I don't think that's reduplication. Yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. See, right. see I, I, that one is also out at the end. Okay. So that's another part of the puzzle. And in fact, uh, I believe is it, is it after the passive, the the, uh, the short causative. Is anybody here? Short one's before it. Before it. Yeah, I'm not really sure. Okay. Uh, I, I know what kind of verbs to test, and I haven't got a chance to do it, because uh, you take verbs like uh, uh, some of the groom... Uh, wasn't supposed to move. Uh, you take verbs like uh, um, uh, grooming verbs. In some, uh, some of the uh, uh, Bantu languages, uh, they don't take uh, any object, and they don't take any morphology, and they're interpreted as inherently reflexive. Okay. And in many of those languages, it's only a few of the grooming verbs that do this. Some of them don't have any of them that do it. Uh, and so you'll have something that will mean, you know, wash with uh, no object, okay, but it will understand reflexively. Uh, and like English. Yes. Uh, but some of them will then take um, the short causative. Okay. And when they have that, then you could get John washes himself. Or you get the, you know, you get the affix, the reflective affix there, okay? Uh, or you could get, you know, a direct object of any sort, okay? So what this does, it says, you know, go ahead, have any kind of direct object you want, okay? It's transitivizing. It's not causativizing, because it's not like John then undergoes washing when he did it before, all right? So it's not, it's something that really makes it transitive. And the passive of these is the ones I want to look at. 
John was washed uh, in the languages where I can set this up. And uh, Lubakusa was one of those, and I just uh, uh, I worked with somebody from that language, and so I just have to, to get in touch with them to see how it comes out. Uh, so whether this, uh, and sometimes there's a certain invocation and so on, you know, it's not exactly, you know, sometimes it just changes the, uh, uh, the nearby uh, uh, consonant uh, in the direction of palatalization or something. But, uh, so uh, that would be an interesting case. In any case, what it would mean is this. If that stuff is here, right, the, the weird thing about the short causative is that it's way at the end, right? I mean, you take this and you know, actually need the, the cart seat, okay? Because those languages that have the short causative, it's way at the end. And uh, so some of those languages will have both of these, some will only have one or the other, okay? And some of them will have both of them for certain uh, indirect interpretation of causation and others uh, for direct causation. So there's a lot to be unraveled there. But the idea would be that maybe the piece that moves is there. Okay? So the stuff that you normally expect to be close to the verb is not close to the verb. Okay? And there's one other little glitch that might be really cool. That's this. Okay? The difference, one of the differences between uh, Bantu and these languages, these Atlantic languages, uh, is that you don't get uh, these uh, object marker climbing effects. None of the Bantu languages I know about allow you to take those things out of the uh, lower clause from the object. Of the Some of the exceptional case might be that you can do it, but not, not out of the objects. Now, suppose that the difference is that in Bantu, when you have your forming your inner stem, that the OM and, uh, is in there, okay? It attaches to the complex verb, not to the VP. When this stuff moves, it's going to line these things up, OM, RFM, verb. You'll get exactly the order that you get. And there's, there's some evidence that this is always closer to the verb than the direct object. So when you have two objects, uh, and one of them is a reflexive marker, it's got to be the second one. That's the question, right? Uh, and so, so if you if you can get two argument markers there, then and one of them is reflexive, it's going to be this one. Oh. <coughs> now, of course, the reciprocal marker uh, shows up in a different place, and you have, well, there's more stories to be told about that. Actually, there's a long story we have about that, uh, motivated by completely different considerations, but that's not for today. Um, so. This could be a way of thinking uh, differently about uh, uh, the uh, Bantu verb stems. Uh, and trying to recover some of the compositional structure that uh, right now is very hard to detect in the way that uh, some of these uh, uh, analyses have gone. And we might be in a better position than simply relying on, well, some of them do it that way and some of them do it the other way. There might actually be some rationality to why this particular ordering might emerge. And it might emerge because there's inner stem. That's the that's the hope. You know, can you go back to Egiman? The reciprocal marker has other functions. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, so it can mean simultaneous. It can mean uh, together, and it can mean continuously. Now, the one that I find most disturbing is continuously, because that really doesn't fit into the story as I have told it. That one seems to be uh, kind of uh, spectral, and uh, not. I mean, you know. Uh, it sort of maybe would fall in with re repetitively. Uh, so it could be one of those very low uh, adverbs. But it's not at all obvious to me why that's so. Now, the reason I say that's all one affix is because the ordering restrictions on it are exactly the same as, uh, as you know, it's not doesn't have a different sound. So there's no reason to think that it, there are, there's more than one affix there. Uh, there's just more than one meaning for what looks like one. It's the same story with the uh, causative and repetitive that I gave, right? Because we couldn't really tell the difference. Mm -hmm. So I don't know for sure that there's a real difference between them. Uh, in the other case, the causative and repetitive, I think there's some restrictions on when you could have uh, causativized uh, um, transitives. Uh, so there's a tendency to interpret those as repetitive uh, rather than causative. But I, I think we also eventually discovered you could get causative meanings out of those too but it required a little bit more context. Uh, so uh, I don't know why continuously would be one of the readings of this thing. And if you look at the, uh, 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 the, uh, 
the many meanings that reciprocals have across Niger Congo, that one usually doesn't go with reciprocal. Mm -hmm. So uh, I mean, certainly simultaneous and together, those often mm -hmm. occur uh, where the uh, uh, range of meanings for reciprocal markers is expanded, but not not continuously. I have no idea why that's so, mm -hmm. and I don't have a theory of it. But it's important for you that it's that it's an Ackman position. Well, I don't know. Uh, I, what I have to now test are triplets. Uh, so when you have, uh, say, ororo, uh, uh, right? Uh, so uh, something like gusal uh, ororo, right? That would be something like uh, uh, <laughs> he's making a face. Uh, <laughs> so uh, they are praising each other for their benefit uh, uh, continuously, right? That would mean. Can you get that? <laughs> All right. So. Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, no. No. Uh, well, yes. Take something like Gusalororo. Uh, uh, Yeah, it's hard because. Like, like if you take big number thirteen, what I'm struggling with is putting the reflexive for the reciprocal. In thirteen. So I can one by one. And actually, I remember one of us asking me that question. And I said, "This must be It could mean this, but that is not something I expect the speaker to say on the flight. Which one? Thirteen. Uh, What was the number? Oh, I think he's frozen. Oh, no. Is it just about? We'll get him back. You've got yeah. 13. 13. Oh, well, there's two 13s. Which one? It's not Serge's fault. It's Ed Jerome's fault. Oh, Ed Jerome. Yeah. I think B. That's what he Yeah. So he couldn't. Well, it's it's an odd situation, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I had that one. I had to give a context to make sure that we yeah. could get it. Uh, uh, so uh, they. Um, hi. Sorry. Hi. Back. Great. All right. So uh, you were asking, I think, about uh, thirteen. Was it thirteen A or thirteen B? Thirteen B. No, I was saying that thirteen thirteen B was fine. Oh, okay. And thirteen uh, and thirteen A, you did not get. I really struggle to have the reflexive before the reciprocal. Every time I give, I look at an example where it offers. I don't know if it's like if it's due to the lexical semantic of the specific verb. Uh huh. Uh huh. I really it's hard to interpret honestly. And personally, I remember I was saying I remember they asked me that question. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, well, I, I only know that I, you know, I have to go with, uh, with my guys, right? Uh, so it's uh, yeah. Mamadou and, uh, and his uncles. But you speak a completely different language. What? <laughs> 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 I think Serge has some comments he'd like to make. Yeah. If you but what's the difference between A and B? Mm. Yeah, so go... yeah, some comments, that'd be great. Yes, yeah, so the, the multiple object ordering. Yes. Sixteen. Sixteen. C. If you have the object marker on, it has to come at the end. Is that the case, or can it come later? Uh, I, 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 I thought it had to be had to be first. Yeah. So the all. Yeah. The all. The all is the uh, uh, is the us, right? And uh, so, so it, it's. It, the the O is the person singular. Yes. O L. Yes. Yeah. O L. Yeah. Yeah. Right. 
Yeah. So, so, no, my question is, according to the uh, ordering you give here, does it mean that the third person singular has to come after the plural? Because if I'm looking at uh, plural object markers, we see it. Yes, we see it uh, singulars unless A, C determine the precedence. Right. So the, there were cases where, um, what's the uh, third person plural is you? I forget. What's third person plural uh, for, for people? Yeah, because these two is for people. So, uh, yeah, so, but I... I so they nurtured them for him. Yeah. And they nurtured him or her for us. Well, I'm, uh, I'm looking at 16D, and the plural comes first. 16D. Sorry, guys, we have to leave. Okay. Uh, I'm afraid we're running out of time. Yes. But hopefully we'll, someday we'll do this in person. You can send me email. Okay, yeah. No, Could you please send me email, okay? If people are free, we can read But these guys have the RPS, so I think it's unfair. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Um, but before that, maybe can thank you very much for a very um, pleasure.